I Love Mortgage Brokering, episode 64. The only podcast for brokers by brokers. I Love Mortgage Brokering will inspire you to up your mortgage business. Join your host, Scott Peckford. Hi, Broker Nation. I'm thrilled to introduce our guest today, Ron Butler. Ron owns Butler Mortgage. He's part of the Verico Network. He's been a broker for 18 years and is based out of Toronto. Ron doesn't really need an introduction, as most brokers have heard of him already. He's fairly active on Mortgage Broker News and CMT. I've been working on getting this interview lined up for some time, and I'm pumped to have you on the show today. Ron, are you ready to rock? Ready to go. Awesome. So can you tell us a little bit about yourself and, and how you got into the mortgage biz? Yeah, I know it for, seems like forever because I'm old, right? I'm being 60 soon, so that's old, trust me. Yeah, I was uh, I was in a different business 18 years ago, and that business was undergoing some changes. I was in the insurance business, employee mm-hmm. um, benefits, really. And so sort of the premise of how we operated was grinding to a halt. There's actually tiny implications the same for the mortgage business. But anyway, sold that practice. Part of the deal was that I couldn't hold a insurance license for two years. And the guy I knew said, why don't you try this? I thought it was uh, worth giving it a kick if it can. And uh, so we, that was what happened 18 years ago. We gave it a try. So you went from basically you're in the financial services industry, sold your practice in the benefits side. And so was having that background, did that help you kind of launch your mortgage business or did you have to go source brand new clients or how was that first starting out? Uh, no, in the employee benefits business, you, you wouldn't have a single client. Your clients are just uh, businesses. Right. You're, you you know, they, they sometimes you're not even dealing with the business owner, you're dealing with a, sort of an HR person. Uh, or an accountant. Um, no, they were not a source of leads. Didn't have a single lead when I started. Didn't know anything about it. Didn't just barely knew how to spell mortgage. Um, and they were, the only carryover was marketing. I understood marketing. I understood what you needed to do to create leads. I didn't know how to do it in this business, but I understood that that was the essence of any sales business. You had to create prospects, process uh, deals, and close. Mm-hmm. So that much I understood. And then you figured the rest out as you went along. And so did you hang your license with someone or how did you kind of, did you, how did you get your start? Cause most of the time you yeah, I started like every other agent, you know, I was uh, roped into a shitty split by a uh, unscrupulous uh, brokerage owner <laughs> and uh, just like 99% of people, right. Mm-hmm. Um, just even though I thought he was my friend, he turned out to be my friend of me, mm-hmm. but uh, uh, yeah, same as everybody else uh, taking advantage of uh, screwed over in the name of, Supposedly getting training that was that consisted of uh, sitting around watching someone work and listening to them and uh, having someone to ask questions for the first six months. I mean, that was the essence of the training. Mm-hmm. And then you had mentioned something just when we first started here that you'd seen some changes coming to the sort of your previous business that you were in. And so maybe we'll, I want to dive into that a little bit later, just about sort of what you see you see happening in the mortgage business. But before we dive into your story, I want to ask about a quote that's really had an impact on your life or business because I love how quotes are portable, they're memorable, there's something you can kind of use again and again. So if you've had a, if you've had a quote that's really had an impact on you? Uh, not really. Uh, I mean, there's lots of things I think about uh, over the course of days. I often think that uh, Nishi wasn't too far off when he said that anything that didn't kill you makes you stronger. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, think, I think about a great quote, uh, more or less just a line in a book. A guy by the name of Isidore Sharp, who founded the Four Seasons Hotel Group, started from nothing. Nothing. Didn't know anything about hotels. Never ran a hotel. Didn't know a single thing about it. Started the greatest hotel, hotel chain on earth from zero. And a great thing that he, he said in his autobiography is he says, I never read business books. And it just crystallized in my head that there's this vast industry of people selling supposedly foolproof systems who've actually never done any of the industry in their lives. Mm-hmm. Whether it's the seven ha- habits that are, you know, designed by some Mormon lunatic or, for, uh, you know, the various guys in our own industry who, uh, like a, one guy comes to mind, at least some of them have worked in our business. One guy comes to mind who's never done a mortgage in his life and claims to be the empresario of mortgages. Mm-hmm. It just it just crystallized in my head that you have to figure out your own way. Mm-hmm. You can draw on information in business. You know, you should be, hopefully people are good. If you want to see the business, you're a good reader. You like to absorb information. You look at various sources. But if you look for people who are peddling systems, you're pretty much doomed. It can definitely be challenging to coach in an industry if you've never actually done the industry before. 
No kidding. So now can you share me? I know one thing talking to successful mortgage brokers and to entrepreneurs that failure happens. It's not fatal, but looking back, there's always a lesson in it. So can you share something that you had failed at, but looking back that you, there was a lesson in it for you? Well, we, we started working with rate sites. As is probably well known in the industry, the, the discount rate sites. Started working with rate sites and with some success, bouncing around up and down, uh, trying to get a handle on it. And at one particular time, we were sort of given an offer by a site or some promises were made and things were done, not by any of the people we're currently working with, but uh, by some, some people we worked with in the past. But even their whole management has changed since. So they're not even the same company anymore. But at the end of the day, through this sort of promises and and chatter and convincing, and in some ways I have no one to blame but myself, but just made a mistake in believing some of the BFRs I was being told. Mm-hmm. We ended up spending an astronomical amount of money on the site one month, like a system, a ridiculous amount of money, like fifty-eight thousand mm-hmm. dollars. And when I looked at the results, they were just ridiculously pitiful. I mean, like just awful, pathetic, disgusting. Like we basically lit forty grand on fire. Mm-hmm. We would have better off buying dope and just handing it out to people and enjoying ourselves. But at, at the end of the day, the uh, that taught me that. You have to be, you have to be like incredibly rigorous about how you control the cost of these leads, like right down to a granular daily hourly basis, monitoring it with the most minute uh, consideration. And in the end of at the end of the day, that helped, but it was a complete friggin' disaster at the time. Right. So you'd have thought that the, the the bigger spend was going to turn into a bigger return, but in the end, it uh, when you sat down to the analysis, it just wasn't wasn't there. Forty grand, forty grand better spent on uh, Vegas or dope or good bottles of wine or something, but not on this rate, not on the rate site. No. Right. So <laughs> that's pretty. That's pretty uh, crazy. Um, I've noticed talking to successful brokers that they always have systems and processes, and they're willing to adjust them. It sounds like that's something that you've been obviously doing, uh, and they. Are willing to t- tweak them to get better results. So, can you share an example of, like, say, an administrative process? Maybe in your back office, you guys do a lot of volume, so I'm sure there's a lot of uh, opportunities for you know things that don't work as well. Um, but then, can you share something that wasn't working and how you've made an adjustment and what the outcome was? Well, I guess the most critical change that we made to our whole process was that we essentially gave up on commission agents. I mean, we still have like I think one legacy person, but uh, we just got out of the agent business got out of the mortgage brokerage, commission mortgage broker business, got out of being someone who's running, uh, well, a smarter guy than me, uh, Greg Williamson called it adult daycare, where, uh, you know, you're just trying to pet people and control people into sending you business and uh, taking a small split. And we just shut that whole thing down completely in favor of a totally salaried uh, environment of people. They're almost all of them are... Well, they're not, not the receptionist, but almost everyone is licensed, but they're just salaried people doing chunks of a business, whether it's the person who does the initial contact with the client, the people who explain the uh, products, uh, the people who follow up on documents, the people who uh, you know, break down to somebody who's ordering a phrase rule. I mean, it's just a massive machine. It's a factory uh-huh. as opposed to a, uh, to a traditional mortgage worker. So that's, uh, that was a, a massive process change. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I talked to Rob McLister and he told me that uh, the company in the U.S. that does this really well is Quicken Loans and they have an upwards of 30 or 40 people can touch a single file, but they close a, you know, a ridiculous number of loans every day. But the process the is... Funny really- story about that. Rob, uh, Rob mentioned that to me once I, I, and he said there's basically seven steps. He says they were willing to give me their, sort of give me their manual. And when he showed me the basic seven steps, it turned out it was exactly what we were doing by sheer accident, which lends me to think that it's just the natural flow of a system where you are receiving, you know, 40 years leads a day. You have to have, you eventually break down a process to kind of all leads in the same direction. Because seriously, it was exactly the same major seven steps that we used and we didn't have a clue that was what Quicken was doing. Right. It wasn't like it was in a business book, like you were saying. Yeah, I don't read any business books. I, I took Sharp's lesson to heart. Right. No, that's good. And so then on the sales and marketing side, so I noticed that successful brokers and business owners, uh, they, have a, they have a sales process and they don't just show up or hope for the best, you know, get on the phone and hope for the best. So can, but they also are willing to adjust that process. So you can share an example of part of your sales process, maybe that wasn't working as well as you'd like, and then a tweak that you made? I would just say it's sort of a really 
you know, looking at, because we have so many different processes we use. We do media advertising, which is chiefly radio. We, we have done over the years um, SEO type development. We've done pay-per-click type work. We've done uh, uh, the rate fights, which we continue to use. And it, it just boils down to this kind of meticulous, granular analysis of what's pending which isn't always easy because some days people will see your rate on a rate site, not use the site as a contact point and just pick up the phone and call you by Googling your name. Mm -hmm. And so it's often confusing to know where a lead comes from, but by using, you know, just, just trying to dig into it and using big chunks of data, you can sort of boil down what's not working. But it is very critical to employ that analysis, that constant daily analysis. We look at reports every day, every single day. We boil reports down that are of what's happened with the leads over the course of that 24 hours. And, and so you were saying a little bit that the, uh, the Quicken Loans, their process is very similar to what you guys have built. So in a typical loan trans situation, so is there like you have seven people? Is there sort of like a, is it a sim- is it similar there's setup? Probably, there's probably seven separate touches to the file. Yeah. That, that people are, uh, yeah, it was interesting. Wait, when I, doing, a, doing a different function on the file. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, when I looked at the Quicken document, it showed that some, there was people that were literally appraisal specialists and income specialists, you know, depending on if yeah, you got. We have, we, have, we have those people. We have a person who just does a great order Orders appraisals and follow steps and, and make sure that the lenders get them. That's all they do day in day. Mm-hmm. Right. So it's like a factory, essentially. You're like Henry Ford. But it is. It is absolutely. It's, it's the the metaphor we come back to over and over and over. It's a factory. That's what it is. It's a factory. So another thing I've noticed talking to people is that they then they need to diversify income, cross-selling other products and services. So you guys obviously are dealing with a huge volume of clients. Do you guys have, uh, is that something you guys focus on or do you just focus on mortgages um, on the like the cross-selling? We just focus on mortgages. Um, the I've always had some ethical concerns about marketing some of the insurance products that uh, is most available for us to market. I think it is an actually a great point of contact, and it's something we constantly plan on developing, and we've taken some steps in the last year to try to get that off the ground by using a referral system so we have fully qualified, licensed insurance people uh, who are using on a lead-sharing basis to contact the client because I've never been crazy about the products that are available uh, for you know, basically group credit or insurance is what's being sold. Mm-hmm. Um, not particularly mad at any one vendor, but I just don't. I just believe that the consumer is much better served by an individual insurance consultant than by group credit insurance. Right. And and one of sort of one of the guiding things that we try to think about all the time is that you know for the if you're dealing with a consumer that is uh, you know. You know how people tell you that they see that the guy has an 800 beacon score, but the guy never really has an 800 beacon score, right? That's just a sort of a code in our business for a great, mm-hmm. for a great credit score. We actually see the 800 scores every single day, every single day from people who are interested in lower rates. Uh, sometimes we'll see five or four or five applications a day where people have those kind of scores. So mm-hmm. they tend to be intelligent, cautious, well-educated, sophisticated people. Yeah, and uh, I don't want to, I, I want to give them, if I'm going to refer something to them, I want to refer something to them that, uh, of the same kind of nature and direction that we're trying to do in the mortgage business. Mm-hmm. So um, we try to refer the kind of product that's uh, on the life insurance side that we think is, that they deserve. Right. As far as other products, no, we, we're in the mortgage business. We just, we, we think that the sale of, of uh, life insurance and property casualty is an interesting field that we want to create good partnerships with, but we're not interested in doing financial planning. Uh, we don't believe we're qualified for it, licensed for it, insured for it. We have to open up a whole new division, and we got a lot more we want to do with the mortgage business before we think about that. Right, your factory is designed to do mortgages, so don't don't mess yeah. with it. And, and even though I'm not, you know, I'm not going to be too critical overly critical of the people who are taking on franchises to sell, you know. Uh, sell personal bank credit and, and, and things of the banking nature. I'm not going to beat that up, but I really, I really don't know if I want to, you know, redirect any, any, even the faintest bit of energy into that. That I, you know, there's just so much more can be done in the mortgage business. There's so much more volume that can be done. So many more units that can be done. I don't even know if I want to 
redirect even thinking about something that you know is not part of doing more mortgage. mortgage you know, mm-hmm. I don't, don't even know if I want to be part of it. Right. That's fair. So you mentioned earlier that you'd seen some things in the benefit business that some changes that were coming, and then you'd alluded to the fact that you'd also see some things in our business. So can you share a little bit about kind of your your take on what's what's happening? Well, there's, there's always you know big differences between industries, but essentially what it came down to was that in the benefit side, it, it turned into a situation where there were going to be very very few players and very 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 few players providing employee benefits does not bode well for people who want to offer uh, price advantages to main marketing points. That part I don't really see in the mortgage business, and yet, because I think there's you know, there's been some new players, and they're good players who've come in in the last five years. Some have left, but some have come in. They're good, strong players. But I think that there's nobody who does mortgages every day doesn't notice that even though there are a whole bunch of monolines that we can choose from, that for most of them, they offer relatively similar products. And at the end of the day, there's a, there's a background underwriter who is an insurer who is calling the shots on the product design. Mm-hmm. And when the product all looks about the same, don't get me wrong, there's, there's always differences. Of course there are, there wouldn't be different companies. Mm-hmm. But when there's a basic similarity to the products and the way it's underwritten, then how do you differentiate? Um, and we've been lucky enough to find that we can differentiate on price. Right. But man, you're you're a day in day mortgage broker yourself. I mean, there's a hell of a lot of similar. I'm sure you see a hell of a lot of similarities between the way files are underwritten and the model lines. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, yeah there's definitely uh, you know some repetition of, uh, and I think going forward, efficiencies are going to be something that brokers and lenders are all going to be, uh, folk, you know, keyed up on is just how do we make things more efficient? Uh, so um, to be out and that'll help reduce costs and stuff. But. So I'm going to move to the rapid fire questions. So these you can answer with shorter answers if you like. So what is the number one thing holding back most mortgage brokers from being successful? Imagination. And what one thing or habit has made you successful? Not listening to anybody. <laughs> That's a good answer. <laughs> and then uh, do you have an internet resource or program you use to make your business more successful? Uh, we use a ton and we continue to investigate a ton. Some of them are kind of customized. I mean, we're just looking at sales. So you're kind of really delving into sales for us right now. Like uh, we're trying to have uh, Adobe make a bigger impact on our business by, you know, loading up on some and, and taking the time to learn and train our people on really how to become effective at electronic communication of documents because that's all we're going to do from here on out. That's it. Mm-hmm. Uh, we, we ran into a guy who did us a great service in producing a terrific app for uh, the Google and the Android store, which I think mortgage brokers are really going to have to start thinking really clearly that in the next five years, mobile is going to take over the entire uh, electronic communication side of the customer. So we got to get we got to get really fired up about that. Start stop thinking old fashioned. Start thinking new fashion. I mean, pretty soon people are going to look at PCs as being a Bronze Age tool. So we've got, to, mm-hmm. we've got to really upgrade our thinking in that area. So this particular app is it? It's available in the marketplace right now. Yep, it's uh, a good guy. But this company's called ben- Benjiji, I think it is. But uh, he's uh, he's out there. Uh, it's uh, but it, look, there's there's people who can build you uh, on Android and a Google app and, a, and an Apple app. And uh, I think you need, if you're not if you don't have a free app in the App Store and today, you're going to want to think about getting one. Mm-hmm. And where do you think the industry's headed? Where's the opportunity in the next five years? So we're just committed to discount. So we're committed to rate discounting and electronic delivery of mortgages, so that we're never going to meet the client ever. And uh, that's the, the two key pillars of our business: efficiency in terms of never meeting with the client and reducing costs by internalizing efficiencies. Mm-hmm. I think it's important to understand that in a in a world where there's a whole lot of four hundred thousand dollar plus mortgages running around, that there is. It's really not a defensible position to make $4,500 from doing a mortgage. That's not a very defensible position moving forward. So, you know, that's, that's where we think the high ground is in the mortgage business. Where the opportunity will be. And so this is one of my favorite questions. It's a DeLorean. Remember the movie Back to the Future? 
Yep. And so the DeLorean is the car you can jump in and travel on time. So if you could, knowing what everything you know now and all the things you've learned over the last 18 years as a broker, if you could travel in time and go back and, and give yourself three pieces of advice, what would you tell yourself um, to have a bigger business today? I would, uh, my first piece of advice if I went back 18 years is don't get into the mortgage business, uh, get into investment banking. <laughs> I, I might have been too late for that too. Seriously, I might have been too late for that. <laughs> that would have been your first piece of advice. Don't get into the mortgage business. Yes, honestly. I mean, when I, I you know, I, I, we have clients who are at uh, a high level since, uh, uh, again, since we started this, this, going down this path of discount mortgage rates, we see people with, from very high levels in businesses and, you know, whether it's uh, capital markets guys and, uh, wow, there, uh, there's some really, really uh, big incomes that are in those areas. I mean, it's just, uh, and when I meet with, when I talk to people on the phone, there's no question they're very smart, but I don't believe they are 10 times smarter than I am. Mm -hmm. They're making an astronomical amount of money. So it strikes me that, you know, 18 years ago, if, if you'd have entered into a field where there was this incredible opportunity to make massive amounts of money, but let's face it, you could be the finest McDonald's franchisee in Canada and you're only going to make a certain amount of money out of your three or four McDonald's restaurants. I mean, it's, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's got its own fixed thing, uh, whether it's a mortgage brokerage, I mean, or whether it's an insurance, life insurance sale, whatever it is, wherever you got to look at, you know, what does the top 20% of any group earn? And I assure you the top 20% of people in the capital markets world earn 10 times with the top 20% in the mortgage brokerage world. Right. And there's some great earners in the mortgage world. I mean, I, I know people who make over a million dollars a year personal income in the mortgage business. And, uh, but let's see, there's guys making 20, 25 million a year in the capital markets world. Right. You, sometimes you got to pick your industry right. You right. You don't want to be the finest coffee shop operator in, uh, you know, unless you've got Starbucks, you've got 20,000 units. Um, but you don't want to be the finest, you know, uh, retailer of bicycles because there's just certainly only so much uh, capacity and profitability in that market. So, right. You're the I, look I, I do look at those things, but I'm too old to change. Like I said, I'm going to be 60 soon. In a couple of years, I'm going to be 60. I can't change now. I'm in it to win it. I'm stuck. I can't go anywhere else now at my age. That's hilarious. Well, you know what? If you're almost 60 or you just turned 60, uh, you definitely have no problem innovating and, and trying to stay ahead of the curve. I mean, you know, creating apps and, and changing your business model and stuff. So, And when you first, just out of curiosity, when you first launched your uh, brokerage, was it the same as it is today? Or was it just like you being like the broker with an assistant? Or what did that look like? Well, we were always focused on advertising. Maybe we were focused on advertising a different way. And uh, uh, so it was different. There's no question. But... Uh, so we've become become committed to what we do, and um, you know we 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 feel like if we feel that there's a great future here. It's not an instantaneous future. Like it's not something where it's not Uber. Like it's not. Uh, yeah, we can destroy every taxi operator in this country to sweep them away like they don't exist anymore. Discount mortgage business is not that. Mm -hmm. It's a slower, uh, much slower, much more. Um, grinding approach. Uh, but every single day, we feel that clearly the future is with us. No different than Mr. McClister feels, um, probably similar to what Dan Isaac feels. We feel the future is in a, a different sort of approach to mortgage work. Mm -hmm. Well, Ron, I really appreciate you taking the time today. Where can people find you online? Google Butler Mortgage. We should be there. And are you guys hiring at all? Uh, we do not hire uh, commission people. We have in three years. Right. So just you have. and Okay. Uh, well, anybody listening to this can find show notes, links to Ron, uh, to his uh, site um, at ilovemortgagebroking.com. Ron, I really appreciate this and I hope you continue to rock the rest of your year. Thank you, sir. The only podcast for brokers by brokers. I Love Mortgage Brokering will inspire you to up your mortgage business. Join your host, Scott Peckford. Hey, Broker Nation, Scott Peckford here. Have you joined our VIP club for mortgage brokers yet? If not, you're missing out. We share exclusive content not available on the web or the show. We share scripts, step-by-step -step guides, and other insider tips to help you save time and make you more money. I can't tell you how many times after I turn off the recorder, a guest starts sharing some awesome advice or a script or, or a tip, and I take the best of this and share it with my VIPs. If you want to get on the list, visit ilovemortgagebrokering.com slash VIP. That's ilovemortgagebrokering.com slash VIP. Oh, and one other thing. Since this is exclusively for mortgage brokers, there is a skill testing question. Good luck, and I hope you continue to rock your mortgage biz.